Hey everybody, Pastor Rick Soto here, and I'm loving on you, and I'm really glad that we can spend some time in God's Word together today. Listen, a bit of a different location this next season. We have a lot of ag operations going on outside, and I can't wait to have you on our farm. It's just the most wonderful experience to be there. This greatest outdoor sanctuary, I think, around. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. But part of being outdoors and around ag operations is lots of trucks and lots of activity. And right now we need to be indoors and uh, not be interrupted by uh, so many uh, machines. And by the way, they actually back up and they have that, make that noise, that beep, beep, beep thing. And so it gets annoying and we constantly cutting away and coming back. And so we'll be indoors for a little bit of a season in life, but not to worry. We're still going to be in God's word and we're going to be enjoying each other greatly. But I want to welcome you to the Ranch Church. I want to ask you to join us live and in person as often as you can. And also want to ask your favor, if you like this video, please uh, click on that like button, subscribe to the channel. And if you guys would start leaving comments below, that would be great. We want to interact with you for sure. So today we just got a really great um, opportunity to look at God's Word in Romans chapter 12. And we're going to be talking about anxiety. So I'm going to pray to begin our time. I want you to focus and dig in and get ready to go to Romans chapter 12. It's going to be a wonderful time together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray now that you would come and be God, sovereign over all of our lives, and do what must be done in our lives that we would know you more and more and that we'd be saved and transformed. Bless every single person listening right now. Give them faith to hear. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles and go with me to Romans chapter 12 as we talk about anxiety and how Jesus overcomes anxiety. And the beginning part of this chapter is actually going to address some of these issues. I'm going to show you how they apply. And these are great words. In fact, if you've been around the scriptures for a little bit, you know these words. If it's your first time around the block, then you're going to really love these words as well. But in the book of Romans chapter 12, the scripture says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. That's a great phrase. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And this next phrase I want you to catch. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That is, by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So these words dominate this book of the book of Romans, and they dominate Christian teaching. And even as they apply to the subject matter that we're going to be addressing right now as it relates to anxiety. And I know that if you are a human being, you have anxiety. You experience it from time to time. It's a natural human reaction. It's uh, part of every single person's life in some way, shape, or form. And there's different ways that people handle it. And I'm going to show you what the scriptures are teaching in this text related to anxiety. But first, by way of introduction, one thing I have to kind of address is uh, sort of how a lot of people do tend to, even in Christ and even without Christ, deal with anxiety. And if you think about a washing machine, a washing machine, you know, it goes round and it goes round. And uh, I have one of those trick ones at home, kind of just like, like sort of vibrates in one cycle and then it goes round and round. But then it ultimately gets into the spin cycle and it's just spinning and it's just spinning and it's just spinning. And I know people because they've told me that they actually really enjoy watching the spin cycle at home. And I don't know, they must be maybe stressed or maybe they have their own anxiety, but they just really enjoy watching that thing go round and round and round as it just drains out. But that is kind of illustrative of how most people handle their lives. And I'm here to tell you that God has so much better for you than that. Most people actually watch the same cycle in their life go round and round and round. And there's no dynamic change. And Jesus himself experienced tremendous anxiety, as I'm about to illustrate. And he conquered it and defeated it, defeated it on the cross and defeated it on Easter morning, which we call the Resurrection Sunday. And I want you to understand that right now. So I'm going to reference John chapter 19, verse 20. So we sort of get into the first way of understanding these words that we just saw here. For Paul is actually teaching, in light of the previous 11 chapters, that we need to lay down our lives to Jesus Christ. In fact, that's part of the dynamic exchange that as he laid down his life for us, we didn't lay down his life for him as we are, as we read earlier and taught in earlier teachings, as we die with Christ, uh, we're raised with him. 
So those are all spiritual analogies. Literally, of course, it uh, leads to heaven, but in the moment it leads to a new life. And so Jesus overcame anxiety, as these words are applied, in John chapter 19, verse 20. And there's a Greek word I want you to understand that I know you're going to really enjoy. It's called tetelestai. And tetelestai is really a powerful, powerful word. Jesus would actually say it on the cross. And tetelestai is a Greek word, and it's actually related to a business deal. And so, uh, at least first and foremost in its history, it's the idea of that, well, we've done this deal. You know, we've shaken on it and we've shook our hands or we've written it on a contract. In other words, the deal is done. We've negotiated the terms. We have an acceptable price. We have an acceptable exchange. And we've actually agreed. And then, and then it's the idea of debt being paid. And so that word from business deal to telesty to debt being paid. And years ago, I was uh, read doing my house, I actually rebuilt it uh, uh, and tore it down to the sticks and had to have it redone and I was doing it myself. And anyway, I was, so I was, I was uh, working on buying materials and I would use a credit card back and forth as I did that. So when I was done with it and I refinanced, got through it, I ended up uh, making a mathematical error and I left myself with something like six, $7,000 worth of credit card debt still left to pay it off. And of course, I just was stressed about that. <laughs> I was really... I felt defeated. I was uh, definitely felt ashamed that I'd make a math error and cost my family a couple grand like that. And so I called the credit card company and uh, negotiated, and they were nice about working with me. Zero interest payments. I, I gave them uh, a, 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 some terms that I thought would be acceptable. They actually agreed to them. God was very gracious and got it paid off, I don't know, maybe two or three years. But at the very end, when I paid that debt, what was really fascinating was that they actually gave me a document. The very top of the document said paid in full. In fact, it actually said debt paid in full. And this legal document, it's a good thing I had that legal document because about a year later, that same credit card company was Chase Manhattan Bank, somebody called me and said, hey, you owe us six, $7,000. In fact, now there's a penalty for interest. And this person was actually legit. It wasn't a scam or whatever. They were just in error. And they thought that I owed them all this money plus interest. Except I had a piece of paper. I was stamped and sealed and had the signatories on there and it said debt paid in full. And so I told them that. Anyway, this would go on for about a year. They would not actually let me go on that until I finally got one of the senior, senior vice presidents of Chase Manhattan Bank. And they were able to see that the document that I had was actually legit, had their signature and had their stamp. And I got a second piece of paper that said it is really paid in full. But that's part of what Jesus is talking about on the cross. He's on the cross, and in reference to anxiety, he has dealt with anxiety. In fact, he was in Gethsemane. And Gethsemane is really fascinating because Gethsemane is actually the Mount of Olives. It's the base. It's on the eastern side of the old Temple Mount. And so that Temple Mount has an eastward projection. And that's because the Temple had itself had an eastward projection. And all of that is a reference to the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve once left the Garden of Eden going out the east gate. And that's a really spiritual principle where we know the Lord will actually re-enter into a new Jerusalem uh, through that east gate. And so everything would have that uh, eastward orientation. And looking down on the temple, that's one of my favorite things to do. One of my favorite things to do is be on the Temple Mount and be looking down on Gethsemane. And so now, of course, it's so different. There's a church there. There's actually still some sacred grounds where Christ was. And there was an olive press there, and that's what it was, an olive grove. There was no uh, commercial development. You could just go into a field to pray. You could uh, go do some work there, but it was really just a complete ag hillside. And so Jesus is there praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and there's this olive press, and it's all a spiritual allegory and analogy to everything he's going to go through. He's going to be pressed. He's going to be pressed. And he's going to experience such anxiety that he's actually going to bleed out. He's going to have those capillaries. He's going to pop in some way. He's actually going to bleed out. He's going to hold the sins of the world, of the entire human race, unto himself. And he's going to go through that. And he's going to, he's going to put all of that sin on the cross with himself. And it's going to die the death with him. And that debt will be paid in full. And that brings us to that word, to telestai where we're talking about a word which initially had meant that the business deal is done, we've agreed to terms, and then if there's a debt, that that debt has been paid in full. But thirdly, that word actually really went on to have a different kind of meaning. It's related, related to a battle and related to how 
battles would be communicated when the battle was over. And so when the battle was over, they'd say to Telestai, which simply meant it is finished. And it was a way of the generals telling their kings and telling the other troops that the battle has been won. We can stop fighting now. We can actually go home. This battle has actually been won. To Telestai, it is finished. And Jesus would utter that on the cross. So how does that relate to anxiety? Well, one of the beginning principles of anxiety, you know, I kind of started with that illustration of, you know, the, the spin cycle just going round and round and round in that way, is that one of the things that can cause a person anxiety and probably causes you anxiety is that somehow you look at the future. And that future could be 30 seconds in front of you. It could be 30 minutes in front of you. You could have a meeting that you have to go to in 30 minutes and you're stressed out about that or a job interview. It could be the next day. It could be the next month. It could be the next decade. It could be whatever. But there's a time period. There's something in front of you. And when you look at that future, it looks blank. And you don't know how to answer it. And so you begin to experience anxiety. And so it's real common in midlife, a lot of couples and a lot of people in midlife, they've been working you know, for half of their life and they go, can I retire? They're looking at the future 10, 15, 20 years, or maybe they want to retire in the next year, whatever the case is, and they're experiencing a certain kind of financial anxiety. Or you're a college student, so you're thinking about well, you know, what's life going to be like after I get out of school, and so you're experiencing anxiety because you're actually working really hard to get that degree, and you're wondering, well, I'm going to work this hard for this degree. Is there going to be a job that's worth it? experience anxiety in that way. So the, the illustrations that are just so endless related to how humans experience life and life in general. And Jesus was experiencing that anxiety and he conquered it through Telestai, which meant that it's finished, meaning this separation between God and man, meaning the shame that human beings would carry, the guilt that they would carry would actually be done away with, which is why Paul comes to this teaching right now and he says, I appeal to you. And I appeal to you really fascinating, he says, by the mercies of God. And so God's been merciful. And he's been merciful on the cross. He's illustrated that on the cross. And so as you begin to experience anxiety, you begin to get yourself centered this way. And in a few minutes, I'll give you kind of an application. But right now, I want to go through the theology. I want to go through the actual Bible teaching of what it means. And so the mercies of God are what dominate our lives to actually begin to separate us from anxiety and give us the ability to overcome anxiety. I'm here to tell you that you're going to deal with anxiety your whole life, but you don't have to be a victim to it. You can be the victor of it because Christ is that victor. The text here that Paul talks about is related to presenting our bodies even as a living sacrifice. And so those are, those are the foundational elements uh, of overcoming anxiety. I want to go to the second principle. The first one was related to Jesus in Gethsemane and this word totelestai, as I'm cross-referencing Romans chapter 12 and giving you an understanding of exactly how Jesus experienced anxiety in Gethsemane and exactly how Jesus overcame that on the cross and the power of this word, it is finished. Uh, so deep and so rich. And that will actually allow you to experience tremendous power over anxiety. But secondly for the moment, I want to talk for a moment here, related to the word which I've been teaching for a few weeks now, Yahweh, which is the idea that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you were at our Easter service in person or you even listened on the YouTube channel in one of the prior teachings, I went through the seven I am statements of Jesus. And you can click on that and uh, listen to that in depth for yourself because Jesus during his life, and there's a Gospel of John illustrates, uh, spoke about this I am, I am. He repeats it many times, and he has seven ways in which he mentions he's the I am, starting with I am the bread of life. Secondly, I am the light of the world as an example of two of the seven. So that I am is a reference back to the burning bush time where Moses actually met the Lord in this burning bush, this absolute really interesting physical phenomena where the bush is on fire, but it's not being consumed. And when Moses finally gets the message that God is saying that I am Lord over all, I'm Lord over every circumstance. I'm Lord over every moment in life. There is nothing greater than me. There's not a second in the entire universe. There's no planet. There's no law of physics. There's no human being that's actually in any way, shape, or form greater than me. And Moses says, well, what's your name? The Lord tells him his name, which is actually Lord. So the Lord is a form of a personal name, but it's actually Yahweh. I am who I am. Which is a way of speaking about the dominant nature of God. There's nothing greater than him. 
And when you think about nothing greater, I want to illustrate this by the dietary laws that Moses was talking about, because this actually plays into anxiety. So part of the, part of the way that we're going to escape anxiety is by drawing close to God and allowing the things that he says that are true to be things that are true of our lives and to actually agree with them. So in the Mosaic Code, these are all the teachings of Moses. Uh, you'll find them in Exodus, uh, but you'll mainly find them in Leviticus and Numbers and you know, kind of a repeat in Deuteronomy. There's these dietary laws. <clears throat> Think about these dietary laws and what they actually mean. What God is really saying there is that I'm actually Lord of over everything. How much am I Lord over everything? I'm Lord over everything you put in your mouth. And that's really fascinating. It's God saying, I actually know what's best for your diet, and here's how I want you to live. And in the new covenant, you're free. You're free. You can make all these independent choices. So, for example, I obviously was not practicing any form of Judaism this past uh, Easter because uh, I got at the store a great slab of pork. I mean, just a great slab of pork. I mean, this big three pound slab. And I cooked it in my cast iron and I glazed it and I browned it. It came out awesome, by the way. It was fantastic. And a big shout out to my friends like Jason Radke, who loved uh, collaborating with me on cooking in my cast iron pan. So I obviously was not practicing Judaism in that way. But what the Lord is saying through these dietary laws is even though you have freedom, I am Lord over those laws. I'll tell you what is the best for you. And the same thing actually is true about our human sexuality. God will actually tell us in the code of law what is best for our sexuality. And on and on it goes. He is saying, I am actually Lord over all of those things. And one way to think of it is that God has the might and the right. That's what Yahweh means. I have the might. I have the actual ability to be God, to be powerful, to have nothing greater than me. And I actually have inside of me the divine right to move in certain directions and to, to, to point you in that right direction. And so as you're experiencing anxiety, you begin to process to tell us today, listen, all the things between me and God, they've been broken down, they've been done at the cross, it is finished. And so when I pray, I'm not praying in false hope, I'm praying in real hope. When I'm talking to God and when I'm waiting on God, I'm dealing with a real God who's actually present in my life and bringing me peace. I'll explain more of those dynamics in a moment. And then secondly, when I think about this God, is God able to handle the circumstances that I find myself? Is the Word of God actually able to do that? Is it right? And does He have the might? And the answer is yes. He has those things. And so in light of that, <clears throat> that's part of what Paul's talking about in the very last verse of Romans chapter 11, where he says, From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory and honor forever. Amen. That God would actually be glorified. And now that is a repeat of chapter 12, verse 1. So I appeal to you, in light of the fact that God is Yahweh, in light of the fact that Jesus is God, in light of the fact that it's finished, in light of the fact that he has the might and right to handle every circumstance in our lives, in light of that, I appeal to you by the mercy of God uh, to be a living sacrifice to him. And so let me just kind of begin to help you understand some of the pragmatics of this. I want to give you one or two that I think you're going to enjoy and love. So really fascinating that the scriptures constantly talk about singing. You know, we actually have a it's called the Psalter or a hymnal. It's the book of Psalms. And we have a, a huge volume of, of words. We don't necessarily have the musical cadence, although we kind of can figure some of that out. But I think God didn't give us the musical cadence from the actual book of Psalms because music and its cadence can actually change through culture and time. And it's beautiful when it does. So one of the things that we know from the very latest research on neurology is that in order to be a happy person, you actually have to sing. And so you have to sing the shower or in a car by yourself, or uh, maybe you have one of your digital devices on and you, you know, you've, you've got those things in your ears and you're listening to a playlist, or maybe you've got an old school turntable uh, on a 45 or something and you're, you're singing out. In other words, singing from a pure neurological standpoint actually makes you happy and helps you experience tremendous happiness, even sad songs, even songs that would actually make you cry are actually very healthy for you in overcoming anxiety, as do happy songs. And so what's fascinating is what we know is that worship is a musical experience as well. 
Worship is the totality of our lives. That's why I'm talking about Romans chapter 12 this way, that uh, the idea of being a living sacrifice and holy and acceptable God, spiritual worship, that is the totality of our lives. So teaching the Word and preaching the Word is actually a form of worship. Reading the Bible, praying is actually a form of worship. Now singing is a form of worship as well. And when you actually sing out to God, it's beautiful and it actually makes you happy. I think it was two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, I was actually at the Chris Tomlin concert here in Los Angeles, and it was great. I mean, just a few hours with uh, a bunch of different artists and groups and just singing and praising the Lord. I just came home so full. I was absolutely just bursting with joy. But when I think about this, I'm really, I think about a, a, a wonderful man uh, that was in one of my former churches. His name was David. And David was in a wheelchair, and he was actually much older than he looked. He looked much more like a teenager, but he was actually in his 30s. And he had severe special needs. Uh, his, uh, none of his hands and feet were of normal size and shape, and uh, he had all kinds of internal issues inside his stomach and esophagus. He had a really difficult time uh, eating. Uh, he needed uh, some oxygen uh, just to worship. I, 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 was, I was assigned to look it out for him. I really came to love this Love this guy, and I had just so much anxiety speaking about anxiety because one of the things about him, since he wasn't sometimes could kind of mentally loop a little bit, so he'd, he'd ask strangers, you know, if they, he could have a donut or something like that, and then he would choke on it. And so the family that would brought him, you know, let us know, and the people that were handling, let us know that he, he had this really serious choking problem. And so it, we, so it was my job <laughs> to make sure this guy didn't choke to death at church. And so if I left him alone for five minutes or 10 minutes, he'd start telling somebody he's hungry. And of course, just by his physical appearance, people have mercy on him. They go bring up a donut. And I'm running from the other side of the sanctuary trying to tell people, don't do that for him. And anyway, one time, uh, you know, I was near him. I was turning his oxygen monitor up so he could worship and uh, you know, he was just singing out praise unto the Lord. And uh, what was so beautiful is that when we were done with that, he, uh, after our worship set together, he, he just turns to me and says, Worship makes me so happy, Pastor. Worship just makes me so happy. Singing out. And of course, this guy could not sing out on tune, but he would just be belting out uh, whatever the words were of the song being played and just say, Worship makes me so happy. And here's a man in a wheelchair, really with very serious difficulties and very serious life challenges. He would weep. He wanted to be married. He wanted to have kids. Those things were not things that were going to be allowed to him. And, and yet he's going to give down his life to the Lord and be a living sacrifice unto the Lord and overcome every form of anxiety. And he did that through worship. And so worship actually really is something that God gives to us as a gift and as a grace with supernatural power to overcome. And I want to encourage that in your life in all of its forms. And then secondly, I want to tell you a little practice that I do. This is kind of prayer words. I call these prayer words. And sometimes when I'm in a moment of tremendous anxiety and I, and I don't have a lot of time to internalize worship or I don't have a lot of time to pray, I've just kind of got to be moving. I've got to get ready to take that next step. I'm in a very serious moment of life and I really need God's help. I memorize certain prayer words. And I'm going to give those to you in the next week or two. But here's one that I use, and you could steal it from me. It was actually given to me by another friend many, many decades ago. And here it is. So sometimes out loud or even in my heart, I say, Jesus power, superpower. And so I'll be going into a situation that's causing me a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety. And I will simply say out loud, Jesus power, superpower. I need Jesus power and I need that superpower. In other words, it's a way of, of just speaking out between heaven and earth that I am not self-righteous. Righteousness of Christ that I'm trusting on is not my own. I have no righteousness of my own actually to present to God. I have only the righteousness of Christ that I could grab hold of and ask and bring that by the promise of God, by the covenant of God as an acceptable sacrifice to him. The only thing I can do is just lay down my life. But I will honestly say out loud, Jesus power, superpower. So you can steal that one if you like. And I've made it a habit and practice when I'm experiencing anxiety at all different levels to embrace that thought and know that there is superpower in Jesus Christ, that he's not forgotten me, that he's not abandoned me. He will not abandon me to the grave. And the very stressful moment that I'm living in is one that Christ will be victorious over. And so I will actually say out loud, Jesus power, superpower. And time after time after time, I begin to watch supernatural power of God help me overcome all anxiety. So these next few weeks, we're going to be talking a little bit more about that. 
And I want to finish by these great words that say, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And what we're talking about here is a transformation away from the natural into the supernatural, away from the things of this earth into the things of Christ. Be transformed. And the nature of transformation begins at the cross. And it begins really, we talk a lot about do you love God and we receive God. What's really fascinating about what Paul has been talking about here for the entire book of Romans, really what he's saying in very common language is you need to stop and realize that the miracle is that God loves you. I mean, you're not all that. But God does love you. And he wants to save you from yourself, that you actually get in the way of yourself so often that your mental map is actually neurologically damaged. And that it needs to be healed, needs to be saved, and it actually needs to be transformed. And so I want to invite you to give your life to Jesus, to actually become that son or daughter of God, to understand that there's actually some things that are wrong with you. The Bible calls them sin, and that's general and specific, and that Christ died on the cross for your sin, and that you can actually repent of your sin, which is actually to turn and to trust Jesus Christ. And then know that Jesus Christ actually died on the cross for you, that he's God in human flesh, that he's God even right now, that he actually came to live a sinless life, to live a miraculous life. When you look at the life of Jesus Christ in the scriptures, you realize you're looking at what a divine life would look like, and it is him. And now there's that sacred moment where between you and God, you actually need to actually do business with him. Jesus in those seven I am statements that I referenced earlier mentions that there's a door and that he actually is that door. So he is the bread of life. He's the light of the world. He mentions that he's actually the door. And he says, I'm specifically the door of life. But later in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus will actually say that he's actually knocking on the door. And he's actually knocking on the door of your life. He says, if you open it up, he'll come in. And he'll have an intimate and real relationship with you. And so I want to pray right now that that transaction would take place. That you would see Jesus' power, superpower in your life. Because I know that that is real and true. And so pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would come and save every single person listening. I do pray for Jesus' power, superpower to come upon every single person, that you now would allow them to come into a saving relationship with you. So allow us to be saved and allow these people listening right now to be saved. Now, if you're listening right now, I want you to repeat this very simple phrase, Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I receive you as my Savior and Lord. I ask you to forgive me of every sin. Take control of my life. Make me the very person you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I know that God has done something supernatural in your life. And so here's what I'd like to ask you. First, I want you to go to ranchchurch.com. And if you're, depending upon what device you're on in this YouTube channel, you can kind of scroll down and you'll find it. But go to ranchchurch.com and there's a contact button there where I want to send you a free gift. I want to give you a Bible. I want to give you some other tools by which to grow deeper and closer to God. And so go to ranchchurch.com and right on the landing page right there is a contact button and you can let me know who you are and we want to be praying for you. Secondly, I want to invite all of my friends out there and thank you for so many of you being participants here with the gospel ministry, but I want to invite you to continue to be a giver. We make no apology for preaching the gospel and being engaged in many positive and good works. And so I want to encourage you to go to ranchchurch.com slash give and participate with your tithes and offerings. We are trusting God to tell many, many people about his amazing love. We want to minister to countless many. So go to ranchchurch.com slash give. Thank you so much. Once again, I ask that you, would, <clears throat> excuse me, that you would click on the like button, subscribe to this channel, and leave a comment. All those things are things that Google looks at and YouTube looks upon very, very positively. Well, I love you, my friends. I pray that this teaching on anxiety is a first good step and very, very helpful to you. I have many more things to say to you that I believe that you're going to enjoy from God's word, especially on this issue. So go in peace, be at peace, and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.